where we're going to try and do a little reflection, not just on the past week, but on the past uh, year and 10 months. It'll be almost, it's nearly two years now since this pandemic, COVID, that has taken over our lives began. I wondered if uh, any of you have an idea of how many people have died from COVID since the pandemic started. Yeah, yeah, 5 million. When this script was being written, it was nearly 4 million, and it's now nearly 5 million. It's 4.8, actually, for WHO's uh, latest number. But of course, we know that estimates are that it could be as much as double or even triple that number. So today, we're going to try and take a step back and look at some of the systemic issues that we could um, learn lessons from to avoid the next crisis like this. We've been spending most of our time just responding to this crisis with vaccines, with treatments, lockdowns, economies, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of issues. And um, we have a really all-star panel for this that has taken their time out to come today and be with us, including uh, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, the chief scientist of WHO, as our special guest. And then the other guests here are all members of the JESDA board actually, but they have significant credentials in public health. So we have Patrick Ebisher, who's vice chairman of JESDA board and the president emeritus of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, which is known locally as EPFEL. We have Professor Chor Chan Tan, who is the chief scientist of the Ministry of Health in Singapore and also head of a new office there on healthcare transformation, which is an interesting title we should, I hopefully hear more about. Then we have Dr. Jeremy Farrar, Sir Jeremy Farrar, I should say. He told me just to say Jeremy, uh, who's a, a, a clinical scientist with uh, incredible history working in Vietnam before he took over as director of the Wellcome Trust, the world's second largest non-for-profit organization dedicated to science and health, and also a key player in some of the big initiatives that, that have been taking shape during the pandemic to both stimulate vaccine R&D, as, as well as to get those vaccines distributed more equitably throughout the world with WHO and other partners. And then we have Math Matthias Egger, who's originally an expert in HIV and has held a range of senior research and academic positions in the UK, United States, and most recently, the University of Bern is the director of the Institute of Social and Preventative Medicine, and currently president of the Swiss National, Found Swiss National Science Foundation. And you're working on research to develop an Ebola vaccine, another Ebola vaccine, I understand it. Uh, um, I was involved in evaluating Ebola vaccine, actually, together with Jeremy in Guinea. At, ah, the first Ale Ah, OK. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they, you should have corrected your bios. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> you were all sent them, so I could give me a few corrections. And then we have Sumya, who's a pediatrician from India and a globally recognized researcher on TB and formerly uh, Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research. So um, with that, let's begin with some remarks from Sumya, first of all, on what lessons you've learned, Sumya, and what WHO has learned from this pandemic. Thank you very much, Elaine, and uh, delighted to be with uh, on this panel. And in fact, I've been following some of the discussions over the last couple of days at the JESTA. And I think it's a very good time to talk about <clears throat> lessons learned because I think it can inform the way that JESTA is, uh, is going to go do its business. <clears throat> Uh, for me personally, it's been, a, it's been a roller coaster ride, as you can imagine, because the science division was created in 2019, just before the pandemic hit. So the WHO did not have a science division, even though science is very much in the DNA of everything that WHO does. So the director general, as part of our transformation process, created a science division, a data division, you know, to really bring very explicit focus. Uh, on our normative work and our standard setting work. And, and also to, uh, like he put it, he said, you know, we are a 70 year old organization. Let's look ahead now to the next 70 years. We have to transform ourselves. So I, we set up the science division with research, with a focus on norms and standards and digital health and innovation. And eight months later, you know, the pandemic hit. So 
all the plans that we had made for how we would structure the science division, what uh, work we would focus on, we had to accelerate and the need became very, very obvious. And so I worked, you know, my team is a small team, but we worked so closely with the emergencies program on many different um, areas. And I could characterize the last 21 months as highs and lows, you know, so we had the best of times and, and the worst of times in a way. The best I think I saw was in the science and the collaboration between scientists around the world, researchers, doctors. I mean, from day one, mm. the folks in China who were actually seeing the patients were communicating, uh, you know, publishing in the midst of that crisis so that the world knew what, what was happening. We learned so much about epidemiology and clinical um, manifestations and treatment from those first few weeks of experience of the Chinese. And of course, again, technology this time, the, the pandemic. Um, fortunately for us, uh, at a time when science and technology were advanced enough that on the 10th of January, we had the whole genome sequences and we knew it was a novel coronavirus. And, and then of course, vaccine development and diagnostic development started within hours of that. So science was able to develop and deliver the tools even far more than we had anticipated. Nobody expected vaccines in less than a year. And the collaboration that we saw sitting in WHO, one thing about WHO, you know very well, Elaine, is the, is the convening power and, and, and the way in which scientists come and work for the WHO without you know, a second thought. You just have to reach out to anyone. And of course, the best scientists around the world, whether they you know, physicists or data scientists, turn to COVID. They put aside what they were doing. So this is why we saw these tremendous uh, scientific achievements. And it's, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to be working with these hundreds and thousands of expert advisory groups. Um, Jeremy is the chair of our um, R&D blueprint, which was set up after the Ebola outbreak, learning the lessons. Um, and Matthias, you were closely involved in that. It was struggle, it was difficult. Research was fragmented, there was no plan. So the R&D blueprint was set up on the request of member states in order to develop a, a roadmap for how you would tackle a pathogen, either a known or an unknown pathogen. So because of that, there was a convening of the blueprint uh, uh, by the blueprint of the group around the world on, in February itself so that a roadmap could be developed. So I know I have limited time. So I just wanted to say that we did learn from the previous uh, challenges of Ebola, did better this time, science delivered. What didn't go so well, of course, I think everybody knows is the, is, is the response of countries is, is the uncoordinated and fragmented response that has led not only to the 5 million deaths, far, far more 5 million notified counted deaths, uh, but also to tremendous impacts on people's lives and livelihoods and poverty, undernutrition, diseases like TB are very badly impacted and we will see the impact only in the coming years. So, We've had a lot of reviews done on the response because everybody is pointing a finger at everybody else. I think the fact is everyone needs to introspect and see what they did right and what they did uh, could have done better, including the WHO. And so we have 250 recommendations from you know several advisory groups that have, especially the IPPR, but also the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board that uh, Jeremy is also a part of. Four main areas, and we can come back to them later, I'll just tell you what they are. One is around global governance. And I think it's very much relevant for JESTA. You need global governance of, uh, of existential threats like pandemics and climate change. You cannot do a country at a time. The second is WHO, you know, for anything related to health is the only agency that brings 194 countries together. So we need a stronger, better financed and more empowered WHO to, to actually do the work uh, that we are expected to do, but we don't have the powers to do. We can't go into countries and demand to see uh, data. We cannot, we work in a collaborative manner. So if countries want that, then the powers need to be given. Thirdly, we need the systems and tools. Uh, and this is where I think artificial intelligence and all of these new technologies are gonna come up. There's the Berlin hub that's been established for pandemic uh, preparedness. We're going to have to harness technology in order to inform people of what's happening and, and perhaps to predict uh, what's coming and, and to be able to respond. So we need the systems and tools in place to prevent, detect, respond to uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics. Um, and then we need a system 
which uh, is equitable, uh, where we have uh, tools that are developed. A lot of them are developed using public funds, taxpayer money, but then they're not made available to everybody. And so we've seen that, uh, again, the pandemic exposed inequalities within countries and between countries. And we need to make sure that, <clears throat> that to address the other challenges we, we have before us today, and there are many, uh, including the many health challenges that we, we work in a different way. Um, and I think the one word is sharing, that's the sharing was missing in this pandemic and, and we need to do better. So thanks, Sumia. And in short, what you're saying is that the science just collaborate pretty well. The politicians did a less sterling job on this whole matter. Um, so now we're going to go around the room and get some more inputs on what lessons you've learned from your various perspectives, starting with uh, Patrick, please. Yeah, I, I am more on the manufacturing. I was just the why I got involved because I was on the board of uh, Lonza at the time when we got a phone call from Moderna to look for manufacturing. That was in early February 2020. And, you know, m my take of this is, you know, science has done a tremendous job by putting two new vaccine technology in such a rapid time, being both the mRNA and the vaccines, no doubt. Now, there is a thing, a, a very interesting advantage of one of the technology, mRNA, for the various reasons that it's, you know, we showed quite incredible efficacy. But, you know, the other, the, there are two other features which are extremely, uh, you know, interesting is speed and scale. Uh, people don't realize, but uh, if you make a new recombinant protein at Lanza, it takes more or less a year. Where, you know, you could produce mRNA in a question of weeks and maybe down to about two weeks. Instead of having bioreactors of 25,000 liters to produce a new protein, you could do Swiss production in about an eight liter bioreactor because it's chemistry. Uh, and, and I think this is a game changer. So it has two things, it's speed and scale. That's the most interesting part. Now there are issues and we've seen it. You know, there was uh, limited capacity at the, at the time of manufacturing because none of the two had really, the good thing is BioNTech had Pfizer and Moderna had to find somebody and they found Lonza at the time. Uh, but, you know, there was also the uh, no, non-coordinated, you know, the, for example, for, for Moderna, the mRNA was produced in, in VISP here in, in, in Switzerland, then it had to be shipped to Belgium to put in lipid marble particle, then it had to be trucked to Spain, you know, to put the fill and finish. All this is far, far too complicated. It needs to be, you know, integrated. The second, well, the third thing is distribution. Just logistically, it's complicated because of the temperature and so on, even though I think this is, will be resolved rather soon. And of course, that we'll speak later on, it's an equality of access, which is a key issue. But now, what should we learn from that? What could we do? And um, I think, so we've started in Switzerland, uh, we're discussing a project called Lighthouse that you know, uh, would give back to states or to countries their vaccine sovereignty. Because I think that's probably one of the most interesting thing that we need to do. And I think technology allows you to do it again. So you could imagine having pilot plants, you know, public private pilot plants. Again, the, the footprint of a, of a pilot plant for Switzerland would be extremely small. But now you imagine if you cover a, a country like Switzerland quickly, you could then also uh, be available for export. And I think some of the solutions will come and we saw it with India. It's much difficult when you have a big country, you have first to cover your own citizen. When you're a small country, you don't have this problem in the sense that you could cover the need of your country and then be geared towards, you know, more export. Now, the second thing is also that, you know, we, we receive what I would call 1.0 vaccine. It's still quite reactive. We still have about 30 to 100 milligrams. The new technology, self-amplified, circular mRNA, will go down. It will be way below the milligram. Now you have companies, very interesting uh, companies that are disrupting the production that you can have. And we've seen, we've invested startups that have a fully integrated system. So you can have a, a little tabletop vaccine producer. It is conceivable in mRNA. 
So you could go, that could do MRA production, lipid nanoparticle, mixing, and then you still have to resolve the fill and finish. But, but you could have the bulk decentralized. So that means you could imagine decentralizing the production. And I think that's one of the technical solutions that we have to think about so that, you know, you could have manufacturing in Rwanda, in Costa Rica, and so on, which was not thinkable. But that is feasible with mRNA technology, probably not with other technology. And I think that's a very interesting thing. So that's what we're trying to, to do in Switzerland is to launch the principle of this, where academic and so on will continue to improve the technology by, by working on mRNA, develop a new lipid nanoparticle and so on, and also fill and finish, by the way, which is an important issue. And so that you, and then you have a pilot plan, you could do very quick clinical trials, which I think mean you accelerate innovation with this. And then if you need, if you had a pandemic, you have the big CDMOs, the long science on this can scale. But I think what you need is to have those small units decentralized and then scalable. But you know, what we've learned and the most important thing, pharma has failed, big pharma has failed. And I think we have, it, it raises issues about the new model who will produce them? Should the state go back and have some sovereignty? Those are very interesting questions. But what I'm just saying, technology is about the, to make this possible. And we think about anticipation here. I think it's the anticipation of manufacturing. There are others beyond issue about distribution and so on. But I think one of the big breakthroughs in those new crises will be the manufacturing capability associated with the mRNA power. So you're talking about integration, small scale tabletop, and vaccine sovereignty, which is pretty radical terminology. We, uh, and for those of us following the, the health debate, we know about the big impasse between the IP, uh, people talking about IP and no IP on-, uh, on Yeah, but just on, on uh, this, let's not forget, there is not that much IP around. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so first, now there's also debate about IP or not. But in all this, and a lot of those new therapeutics, you know, the real key thing is the sequence. And this is not, you know, protectable. So LNPs are good, but you have many different possibilities. They will improve. It's about like engineering. It's like your cell phone. There's not that much IP. You can always, you know, find a way not to go around, but to produce. So I, don't, I personally do not think that the IP is a major barrier to that. It is much more your, your technical development to miniaturize and to produce in a reliable, you know, hands-off so capabilities. It's, it's great to hear that we can break through that impasse, which we've heard so much about in the political sphere. Uh, let me go to Matthias now, who's going to tell us about lessons he's learned. Okay, so uh, thanks go. very much. So I've learned lessons about Switzerland and about <laughs> science and politics in Switzerland. I already knew that Switzerland was the most innovative country on earth. But having to deal with this type of crisis, um, being the most innovative country on earth doesn't really help that much. Switzerland hasn't done particularly well in this crisis. Um, it has uh, done worse than Germany, for example. It has done much worse than the Nordic countries, um, with the exception of Sweden. But uh, Norway and Denmark basically didn't have any excess uh, mortality. It has done better than the UK. Um, and uh, these sort of between country um, differences I find quite fascinating. Now, when you look at the Swiss system, we are very good at moderation. We are good at long-term compromise. We are good at thinking hard and long about things. We are not very good at acting quickly because we may, we may actually make a mistake. When you act quickly, there is a risk of making a mistake and we do not want to make mistakes in, in, uh, in, in Switzerland. So, so our political system is not ideal uh, for such a crisis. Also, <clears throat> I think in, in Switzerland, um, politics are not very um, uh, scientific. 
and science isn't very politicized. They are really quite separate. And we do have a two communities problem. Um, we have problems to communicate with each other. And we lack established <clears throat> mechanisms how science and politics can um, talk to each other on a regular basis and exchange and listen um, to each other. We, we don't have a tradition of evidence-based policymaking like the UK has. Um, and I think the lessons we need now to learn is how we can change this and how we can tackle these um, challenges. For example, we need mechanisms that in such a crisis, we can very quickly have the evidence synthesized and um, have it made available in a way that is um, understandable. Politicians don't want to read um, long academic papers. They want information for action. And scientists want to write long academic papers and publish them in high impact journals. But high impact journals don't necessarily have high impact on policymaking. So there, there's a whole range of challenges that we, we need to address in that context in order to make Switzerland fit for the next crisis. So two communities and also the Swiss, Swiss watch sense of moving. I think Alain Berset said at the beginning of the crisis, he said, we'll move very aggressively, but slowly. And a lot of us expats got a, a chuckle out of that because it was a very Swiss approach, I think. Um, now we'll go over to Chor, Chor, Chor am I? Chor, Chor yeah. who is gonna tell us about Singapore, which I think had a very different experience and a, and a really exceptional uh, response to the crisis. Perhaps tell yeah. us about lessons learned from your side of the world. Thank you. I, uh, if I can only choose one uh, lesson to learn and share about this pandemic, I would choose integration. Integration. Uh, integration of systems, integration of efforts. And it's uh, really critical to learn from this to do much better in integration for infectious disease pandemics like the one we have. And for the other pandemic, which is equally daunting, which is the pandemic of chronic diseases like diabetes. For that too, integration is really critical. So let me explain what I mean. If we look at the cross-country comparisons about pandemic response to COVID, one of the features was the fact that places where the response was fragmented tended to do less well than places where integration was much better. But almost all health systems showed some degree of fragmentation. And this fragmentation occurs in different dimensions that in Singapore, we are looking to strengthen further. So the first is really data. You know, having the right types of data, data sets that are interoperable, data sets that can be quickly shared and analyzed and provide insights for action. So there's a, a lot that we can do for data integration uh, not just within a country, but across countries to accelerate our ability to make decisions faster. Then there's also the integration between the response efforts and between the response efforts and the rest of the healthcare system. Because as we all know, uh, there is the public health response, but eventually there's uh, a impact on the wider healthcare system. And if we didn't attend to that integration to bring those elements together, then again, our response would be suboptimal. But it goes beyond the healthcare system, as we all know. Uh, as Sumia mentioned, there are issues of the hard to reach, uh, health disparities, disadvantaged populations. So it has to, we have to integrate the health response with a wider societal response, including communication, building trust, ensuring that no one is left behind. And uh, this is an integration that is really critical for an infectious disease pandemic. It's also absolutely necessary for uh, chronic disease, non-infectious types of uh, epidemics. And uh, finally, there's also the integration between uh, science, technology, as Patrick uh, was explaining, uh, and the response. And here, I, I think that uh, what we've seen is a tremendous progress and excitement. I think 
it clearly demonstrates a new model by which science and technology working closely with the private sector, the civil society, philanthropic sector and governments can really accelerate the movement from idea to large scale deployment. I think that's an enormous lesson and we can build on it. But I think there were two things which we should reflect on and see how we can do better. The first is how do we integrate the social and behavioral sciences into our overall science response? So when you think about the epidemic models, the mathematical models that we create, uh, many of them don't actually factor in the behavioral aspects, which uh, you could argue are the greatest determinant of the outcomes. So we do need a much stronger focus on the social and behavioral sciences and its integration into uh, the current uh, conventional types of epidemiological uh, research. And I think the other very difficult area is um, the time it needs to generate evidence. So all of us say, well, we want a science-based, a science-informed response, but there really isn't enough time. It takes time to build that scientific database to reach consensus. But in the meantime, there's a pressing urge to act. And so we are in this constant state of tension where the scientists say, we don't have enough evidence, but the politicians say, by the time you get the evidence, it's too late. <laughs> so we do need to find ways in which we can bridge between the, the, the time and rigor by which science is generated and the time to act, as Matthias has rightly pointed out. Uh, it's a, a situation which I think plays out in all parts of the world. And it's something that we have to reflect a lot upon. How do we provide the best judgment on current data without having the actual data to be absolutely confident that it's true. Thank you. An important point, finding the way to act fast on, on scientific data when scientists don't want to come to conclusions very quickly. And also bringing in social and behavioral, which Sumya, as you know, from working at TDR, implementation research, which is an important but under-recognized field in the health sector. So now last but not least, Jeremy, who I think you wrote a book about the pandemic Spike, is, is that correct? So um, you might have even more to say all the rest of us about this, having <laughs> for this whole book. Tell us a little bit about your lessons learned. Uh, thanks very much. But my lawyers suggested not to mention anything that's in the book. It's <laughs> oh really? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I didn't know I was being sued. For so it's right. difficult to it's difficult to follow all of those comments and come up with anything new. But but it, to Cho Chuan's way of framing it in one thing, that the, the word I would use is is anticipation, and I think that brings it back now to Gesda, um, because this did not come out of the blue. Um, look back in the last 20 years, the world had a series of warnings, but going back, at least in my experience, to something which few people now would remember, but in 1999, a very, very unpleasant outbreak of something called Nipah virus in Malaysia, and indeed in, in Singapore, now endemic in, in Bangladesh. And, and the features of, of that were actually the antecedents of what we saw in SARS-1, in SARS-2, in MERS, in Zika, um, in the pandemic of 2009. I mean, in the last 20 years, every two to three years, we've had a warning of a national or regional issue which disrupted the societies in which it happened in. Um, and anticipation is important because I think what governments really struggle with is that ability to deal with today's issues, which are pressing and which require a great deal of attention, but to think forward in a way to prepare for that future. And where that anticipation, I think, takes you is the fact that you cannot establish all of the things that we've heard here in 24 hours in a crisis. What you have before you go into a crisis largely determines your ability during that crisis, whether that's the inequalities in your society, the strength of your institutions, the strength of your science base, and critically, and I would say here the UK has done this well, despite doing dreadfully in the pandemic, and that is that all of that anticipatory work has to have an aspect and a feed into the government political system. You cannot establish those relationships between politicians, scientists, and indeed society in a crisis, because you haven't built up. And if, as a, as a politician, I won't mention any countries in particular, but if you spend your term in office undermining many of those institutions, either financially or morally or intellectually, 
you will struggle when you need those institutions in a crisis. And so, so I think anticipation for me is the key element. It actually goes into what Patrick, Patrick and I have talked very much about this decentralized issue of vaccine manufacturing production. Unless we move manufacturing production for epidemic-like diseases out of large population countries, we are always going to struggle with this domestic versus international tension. And, and my belief, pushing Patrick's um, comments a little bit further, is we need a, a global mandate for what I call small population countries to produce at a global level, both for their own citizens immediately and then be able to export. So the Switzerland's, the Singapore's, the Denmark's, the Costa Rica's, the Rwanda's of this world. If we leave it all in countries with 300 million people or 1.3 billion people or 1.2, we will always face this tension. And I think that's where science can take us. On the second issue, which comes back as well to Gester, is that I think we're in a period of political history when we are struggling, when our domestic demands and pressures pull us in one direction, vaccinating your population is the example, and yet your international responsibilities and indeed your scientific rationale, logic, would take you in a different direction. And I think very few countries have been able to bridge that tension, where you have a very nationalistic drive and you have an international responsibility, and in fact the international responsibility brings with it self-enlightenment. But I think at the moment uh, we struggle with that tension. And then lastly, to Gesta, that I believe is where Gesta needs to play its role. We talk about multilateralism, we have to accept in this crisis at the moment, multilateralism is failing. We have an inequitable world, which all of us on these panels over the last two or three days have argued against, and yet that is the reality. And so when we look forward to the other crises of the 21st century, inequality, climate change, energy access, how are we gonna deal with quantum computing? that's been an eye-opener at this meeting. We're gonna to have to deal with those issues. And we're, if we leave the world with the warm words, but when we put pressure on the world, we just revert to our nationalistic tendencies. We will fail to bridge the world together in these transnational crises. That for me is the biggest lesson of COVID. Okay, big, big lessons. We've got to pull together. We've got to address the wider issues. We, we had the warning signs like Nipah virus, SARS-1. We didn't pay attention to them. Um, let's, let's try and go a little broader now and look a bit more systemically beyond just the health sector and talk about how still the health sector can respond to some of the wider threats we see. And I'm going to start with Sumia now, and I wanted to ask you, Sumia, a little bit more about, um, you know, we've, we've faced issues of, we're facing climate change, deforestation, urbanization, and a big uh, strand in this current crisis has been trying to determine if the virus emerged from a lab escape or a food safety breakdown in the food chain. But either way, we do know that we have more and more zoonotic viruses coming out of the wild and into human habitats. And that's an issue that the health sector needs to tackle much more directly than it has. So I wanted to ask you about what WHO can do or what you'd like to see WHO do more of in terms of tackling zoonotic diseases as such, the risks to food systems from wild wild food markets from, we also have a tremendous problem with AMR, antimicrobial resistance, which emerges out of overuse of antibiotics. And a big portion of that is the livestock sector, not the health sector, actually. In fact, the biggest portion, I think. So how can WHO take on these challenges um, more directly? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. And I think, again, we've had several reminders that, that human beings you know, are not really living uh, in a sustainable way with, uh, with nature uh, because of all the things that you mentioned, the growing urbanization, the cutting down of forests, the illegal trade in wildlife. Um, we've known for some time what the risk factors are for these, uh, you know, zoonotic events to happen. And yet, you know, we continue because of the pressures that people want and, and development. Um, we still continue to cut forests and, and, and we're encouraging the likelihood of more such events happening or viruses jumping from animals to humans. But also it's very well, it's related to climate change. And um, the fact is that the people who will bear the brunt of the impact are not those that are directly responsible for this. So again, that really highlights the inequalities in, in society, the most vulnerable, you know, who are living along the coasts in many countries like Bangladesh, you know, who are going to suffer from uh, sea level rise. So we do need to think, <clears throat> and, and we know now that um, 
a disaster in one part of the world, you know, impacts the rest of the world as well. And this is why you need uh, to think about uh, solution where everybody's putting their head together and contributing. When we, when the WHO talks about universal health coverage, and as you know, that's one of our major flagships, we're talking not just about healthcare delivery and building more health centers or hospitals, but we're, we're talking about the determinants of health. You mentioned the social, the economic, the environmental, and the commercial determinants of health, which today account for uh, a large part of uh, uh, the health burden. You know, Hans Rosling had a very nice graphic that he used to show on uh, many years ago with the five fingers of the hand where the, these were the things that impacted your health and only the little finger was health care, like less than 10% of what happens to you is determined in the healthcare settings. The remaining 80% is determined by where you live, your housing, your food, your nutrition, your water, et cetera. So those are the elements which we need to be paying attention to if you want more healthy populations and, uh, and those are all outside the health sector. So it's not the health minister of the country who can do anything about it. This is why it has to be, uh, you know, intersectoral work. It has to be at the head of state level. Every uh, department of the government needs to think about it. And this is where the One Health, you know, we talk about One Health, but it's really much broader than that. It's agriculture, it's environment, but it's also industry, it's roads, it's, you know, urban, um, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and, and we're focusing a lot on technology. We have you know, programs of smart cities and so on that are trying to link data and technology, but usually health is neglected in, in those. So we did come up uh, and at the COP26, I think there'll be a lot of discussion. WHO is leading efforts with many other organizations to really focus on the health aspects of climate change and, and what we can do. And there are concrete things that we've come out with I think something like 80 actions as part of a healthy manifesto that governments need to start doing. A lot of the things within the health sector, but a lot of them lie, lie outside. So uh, this is really the time for integration and, and for thinking much more broadly across society and having these discussions, I think, with uh, society. It cannot be siloed discussions within, within each sector because they're all interlinked. And each action has an unanticipated reaction somewhere else. So this is again, I think, anticipating. Uh, sometimes you do something because you think you're doing good, but it's had a it's, it's had an unanticipated impact, which uh, you should have thought of. If anybody would like else would like to jump in, I can go in order again. But um, I'm just I saw you nodding your head. Sure, <laughs> I thought perhaps you might like to say something. Particularly, I'd love to make the link between some of the issues that Sumia mentioned and how that can still help us prevent the next zoonotic disease from jumping out of the wild into our um, homes? Yeah, I think it's a very important question. And uh, the way I think about it first is, are there better ways in which we can get early intelligence? And today we have many, many new tools, not just um, sequencing tools, uh, digital tools, data sharing tools, modeling tools that will give us a much better way to detect signals where, where the danger spots are, which organisms are likely to become the next emerging infections, how do we share the information? So I, I would say the first part is just intelligence. And uh, riding on what we've learned uh, in COVID, I think we can accelerate this uh, as, as, a, as a global cooperative effort. Then the next part of course is what do you do with that information? <laughs> Uh, who, who should act on it or who should help to um, coordinate some actions that we can act on it um, in terms of um, preparing, uh, getting a deep understanding of the organisms of interest, uh, the nasty bugs that might become the next pandemic, uh, understanding these so that when the time comes, we are better able to trigger therapeutics, vaccines, etc. I think that's a role where I, I believe WHO can play a very important part to, to help us to garner this uh, increasing intelligence about global hotspots and what can be done. And then the final part, of course, is how will we act to uh, mitigate the risks? And it is uh, not going to be a science-based or a medical type of intervention. It's got to be a much broader-based 
sets of interventions extending into animal husbandry, the way people live, the way people work, uh, addressing some of the social um, determinants of health. So, so those are the big categories. Each of them represent a massive challenge, but I think we do need to have a, a broad concept that encompasses these different elements and uh, try to work out from what we've learned now, how do we do it much better, much faster? And how do we move more quickly from understanding to preparation and to possible action? Thanks. Patrick, yeah, you were I, I, singing. I very much agree with you know, the need to inter intelligence and the need to anticipate, and that's why we're here. But you know, let's not forget that we were quite lucky with COVID. We were lucky because we had understanding because of SARS and MERS. We had a, we had a target a spike, but there's many other ones that are around where we don't have necessarily a target. So now it's interesting. We have a new vaccination tool, mRNA, that could be scale, speed and scale. But if you don't have the target, you will be stuck. So I think one of the, if you want to anticipate, one of the most important is to do those small trials, decentralized where things are, are just so that we can extinguish them before they become a pandemic. So I think to get this intelligence, to get the biology, because we need the biology, and then we have this decentralized manufacturing that we have to push. So in terms of anticipation, you have, again, a fully integrated. But I think what we're lacking in the weakest point now is the biological understanding of this necessary, you know, the virus or, or other you know, potential organism where we do not, do not necessarily have the target. <laughs> And I think this is going to be the most important, and this is expensive. That's where you know the welcome trust of the world can really help to try to get this kind of research going for small clinical trials at places where things are emerging. Jeremy, you're going to jump in well, now. I agree with George one to to ninety nine percent of it, which is um, surveillance is only useful. It's, it's stamp collecting unless you do something about it, um, and. We've mentioned, you mentioned the origins of this virus. The current political impasse globally is putting the world at great risk. All of the cooperation, including with some great scientists in Singapore, for instance, with other parts of Asia, including China at the moment, has all but stopped. We have no idea what is circulating in the animal kingdom in vast tracts of the world at the moment because that international cooperation has stopped. And unless we resolve that problem, if that goes on for one year, two years, five years, and look back in the last 20, we will have another event. So at the moment, that political impasse is preventing that international scientific cooperation going on, and it puts us into a very vulnerable place. The second thing I'd say is that when we get that information, and we know many of the families that, of viruses that could potentially cause something, we then need to do something about that, not just put it on a shelf. And that is going to require a different relationship between the public and the private sector. There are no incentives for the private sector to produce things which really only they can produce, but which they don't know will ever be used. There is no market force. It's also what drives the problems of drug resistance. So somehow we're gonna to have to bridge that gap. And frankly, I think the public sector is gonna to have to step in and say, these are of such global security issues that we're going to have to have these products, not, not just in theory, we're gonna to have to have these products at phase one, phase two studies clinically. So they're there and ready to go with a manufacturing capacity to, to bridge it. And that doesn't now happen because there are not a current construct of the public and the private sector um, functioning. Pushing that a little more, uh, what about COVAX? What about the global vaccine facility? There's been a lot of criticism that it's built onto a charity model. Um, is there a way to remake that? Because the pipeline issue has been discussed quite a bit, the lack of investment and the need for public investment in the latter stages of the pipeline to, to bring along new antibiotics, for instance. But on well, it, COVAX, how, how, do you, how will you rebuild COVAX in your ideal world? So, so to, um, the bias of being involved in COVAX, so just take that um, yeah. at the start of it, and one of the founders of CEPI many years ago. Um, uh, and from the lens within COVAX, <laughs> I would say the problem is not COVAX. The problem is national governments willing to do what's right for the world and share with COVAX the, the, the stuff that they have, essentially vaccines, therapeutics, and PP and oxygen, but essentially vaccines. And ultimately, all of these, including WHO, all of these multilateral agencies are really dependent on national governments. If national governments want them to work, they can work. But frankly, if national governments 
choose not to work because they're pulled in this direction domestically, then those agencies will struggle to work. And I think that lies at the heart of GESDA, trying to get that bridge between national tensions, national um, pulls and international action. Okay, and Matthias. Uh... Uh, just, just to bring this a little bit back to GESDA, we've got the vice uh, chair of GESDA here and a few members of the board. And we heard about the Berlin hub, um, which is all about surveillance, if I, if I understand uh, correctly. So Patrick, could Jester take this one step further and create a Geneva hub, which actually builds <laughs> on the Berlin hub and does what you and uh, Jeremy, and he's already shaking his head, um, are proposing uh, in order to push this agenda forward to actually stop just watch, but actually uh, anticipate what's coming and have a hub which looks at, you know, the, um, the needs in terms of um, producing uh, these antigens and do it in a decentralized uh, matter in order to, you know, push Jester perhaps a little bit taking it a little bit uh, down towards a more practical um, application uh, like the Berlin Hub has, has now done? It's an impossible question to answer, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think we should, as Jezza, really, uh, uh, you know, study the case because we have, you know, perfectly, we have the today's, you know, uh, issue, and then we have the tomorrow's. We're here to be there, you know, to try to think of a better integrated system for the next pandemic, you know, and, and I think, yes, you need intelligence. It's very clear, and it's great that Berlin is doing it, and I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable. You have WHO here, which is a very great partner. We hope it'll become stronger because we all agree that it needs. Then I think you need uh, what uh, Jeremy said, you need to bring the, the, the private sector in, which is going to be probably the most difficult thing. Not because they don't want, but you have to find you know, the financial incentive for them to come. My personal view is you need to go back to this kind of a public-private sector you know, system to be invented. And I think on the manufacturing, this, I think there's a rather clear path of, of what could be done. And I think technology will disrupt despite what private sector so the private sector will have to adapt to what i would call this point of care you know also this regional of care uh, that will coming i am i'm coming back to the same question is with those emerging we have now the who came with a list of potential things out of those many of them if they outbreak i don't think that we have a clear understanding of the target you know, to be done. So I think that's you know, where the most work has to be put on so that we have, you know, we will have the intelligence to know where it comes. We have the decentralized manufacturing, hopefully, in the years to come. But I think how are you going to get, you know, this, which is going to be a tedious, long, expensive, who will support that? And I think you will need a mixture of private, of big philanthropy, and of state. And for this, you need a place to integrate. Maybe Geneva is a place to do this. And certainly, JESDA should really push and start to really work on it. And because with the expert that we have, we should be one of the best body to try to anticipate what to do for the next one. And of course, if it's going to be done in Geneva, why not? So more work in Geneva as a, as a nexus point once more for um, anticipating the next pandemic. Uh, we're going to go now to some questions from the audience. Oh, I see lots of hands being <laughs> raised already. Is there a microphone to circulate yeah. or? Uh... Yes, she said. Okay, so let's just go left to right. This gentleman here, try and move across the audience. The fact that Switzerland, the arch country of hygiene, has been short <laughs> of alcohol for several months at the onset of the pandemics has nothing to do with science. So it has to do with what? We know, or we could know, that it's very likely that in the coming years, there will be a 
terror bomb, bio bomb planted in a major city. Do we get ready? As a journalist, I ask for 10 years. I understand they don't even get my question. So when or if a bio bomb is planted in a major city, we will be totally unprepared. So, and why? Not because people are stupid, because of that ideology that responsible people have to be optimistic and positive. And being positive, if even the ideology of JESDA is the ideology of the UN, is the ideology of governments, and it is the ideology of most media you cherish like the new humanitarian and Geneva solution. Okay. So my question is, are you part of the problem or of the solution since you want me to be short? Not you personally, your agency, your narrative. And I have a second very short question. In Geneva, there are regular medical events at Palexpo, for instance. Now there is, or it was just now, Vita Food, which is half scientific. There was something on medical devices last week or two weeks back, who among you or among your colleagues has visited these events? Okay, let's take, please try and keep your questions short and ask questions, not making declarations. Um, sorry, but let's polite. But um, let's go, this gentleman here in the front, uh, well, she's already in the back, sorry, we'll come, come around. Please ask short questions and then we'll- Sure, uh, Stefan German, Botnar Foundation. Uh, my question is to Sumia. You're sitting with half of the board of Chester there. And Jeremy mentioned in terms of anticipation, I was more than a decade ago in a WHO hosted global pandemic preparedness, and it was clear. We knew it's coming. We didn't know when. What would be for you success for Chester if they could only achieve one thing in five years that they should really focus on? We know that there is a disconnect that most of the issues we need to address are global of nature, long-term unpopular. Our political systems are national, populist, and short-term. Okay, keep going. Let's get a couple more questions and we'll try and tackle the answers. Well, this uh, builds actually on these last two points that have been made. Uh, I also remember 20 years ago being in a pandemic preparedness seminar, and I can't say that there was much that was said today that I didn't hear then. Uh, there's a few things that have changed. I think we can think about that. We've been lucky with the RNA approaches that have speeded up vaccine production. Uh, we saw that the SARS and some of the concerns around pig flu uh, mutations perhaps helped us build some of the capacity for tr traditional approaches to vaccines. But as has been said, we were lucky with this one. And as tragic as it's been, we all know it could have been a lot worse. And yet we knew that 20 years ago. We knew that we could have dealt with a much more serious pandemic. Yet, Increasing the production capacity has been difficult to do because you do it and then it lies fallow for the next decade in anticipation of the next tragedy. So again, I think we need a different narrative. And I think the narrative becomes very complicated because the narrative has to be a defense-based narrative. Sir, what's your question though? Can you just ask well, My question, question to you is, we're saying a lot, somehow we have to be able to do this, somehow we have to be able to do that. And I think the somehow has to be a defense-based narrative. And I'm wondering how we're gonna create that with also not creating the fears of synthetic biology or research going on in laboratories and escaping, how we're going to create a narrative that allows us to ramp up that capacity without simultaneously creating fear within the public. Okay. Let's just take one more question and please ask a question and make it brief. The person with his, one of you two, you have to decide between yourself. The, the lady, the lady with the hand up there. Kautar uh, Dwidi, pharmacist and global health student at the Global Studies Institute. And I have a question directed to the WHO representative, Ms. Uh, Somi Nanton. 
Um, during the pandemic, we've seen an unprecedented uh, rise in the counterfeit medicine, the circulation of counterfeit medicines, and more specifically counterfeit antibiotics. People all around the world could provide chloroquine and uh, azithromycin online. And um, we're, today we're facing a silent rise uh, of pandemic antibiotic resistance. And I was wondering how WHO in collaboration with countries could have acted to best anticipate and prepare for this silent pandemic that we're facing. Thank you. Okay, let me turn it back to the panel. Um, anybody want to take a shot at some of the... Uh... I could start. Uh, yes. <laughs> maybe I can start uh, Stefan's question um, as to what I would like to see from uh, the JESTA uh, in terms of, and it's related to the other questions of, okay, we now have the tools and the technologies we should be able to to use them to anticipate better, to do better surveillance. Um, I think what JESDA can do is because it's trying to bring scientists together with diplomats and hopefully diplomats reach politicians, and then you're also bringing society together. I think some of the solutions have to come from, uh, from people. I think because of the nationalistic tendencies that you know, have been mentioned, which have been a barrier uh, the only way those can change is if if people give politicians the mandate to to behave in a different way, right? Because otherwise, the pull is always serve you know people within the country first. So if people around the world say no, this needs to change. We need to think of ourselves, you know, as as a much broader global community. Then that's the only way that science and technology tools can can deliver. So I think starting these debates. And perhaps advancing these debates is most important. And, and the other thing I think is we have to, when we talk about new tools and technologies, always have to consider the, the risks and the downsides and be aware. And I, I know there was a panel yesterday, I think, where one spoke about the ethics and the governance of artificial intelligence, for example. So again, countries really need to, uh, and, and the only way that will happen is a, a debate in, in society, in people, at holding uh, their governments to account, holding international organizations to account, asking questions and, and demanding uh, solutions that are equitable and transparent and inclusive. So we've tried to address at least two of the new technologies, genome editing and artificial intelligence. We had a multidisciplinary group of experts that looked at the ethics and the governance that's going to be needed, what frameworks need to be put in place. And we're hoping to start you know, those debates going forward. Um, the other question was very specific around counterfeit uh, medicines. This is not a new problem, of course, and the WHO you know, has been working. And again, I think technology helps us now because you can now track, uh, track products from the time they are manufactured in factories to the place where they, uh, they land using, using uh, these uh, codes that, that you can put on. So I think that, that's, and they can be quite affordable. There are lots of innovation happening in that in that space. And so we have to continue to work though. Uh, yeah, it's a challenge. I don't think we, we've tackled it completely yet, but it needs cooperation also between yeah, governments. I'm being warned that we, we want to make sure we have enough time to, we have a poll coming up, but does anybody else want to uh, <laughs> uh, respond? To the challenge, uh, of course, we're part of the problem. If, if we weren't all part <laughs> of the problem, um, we wouldn't have had the outcome we've had. So clearly to your challenge, then all of us are part of that problem and we have to solve it. But on, on what would you hope, given we've got the chair and deputy chair of, Dep of Gesda here, if for me, it's all about this challenge between the domestic and the international approaches. And that's, I think, where, where Gesda is. And the last thing I'd say, even though coming from a background in emerging infections, don't place your future on emerging infections because that won't be sustainable. Face it on the issues of relevance today and tomorrow and every day and build it into those structures and have the spare capacity resilience and the wit to act quickly in response to something. But, but don't base everything on something that may never happen. Invest in what is working day to day. And that goes back to universal health coverage and everything else. Okay, it's very briefly uh, and then we'll... Brief and I, uh, I kind of think um, of it in a few ways. One is, uh, do we have the ability to act if we wanted to, the optionality to act? And that is a function of signs of uh, understanding targets being having a technology to develop solutions. So we, we need to start with the optionality to act so that when the next uh, pandemic comes, we start with the usual responses, but soon after we can come in with much more specific solutions. So that's the ability to act. Then there is the impetus to act, which is 
can all the different players come together in order to uh, create solutions that work for a majority of people? And then there's a strategy to act. And I, I think we uh, could focus initially on the optionalities that allow us to act. And uh, then there's a lot of work to be done, I think, on the impetus and the strategies to implement. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, in response to the, uh, the first uh, question, Einstein famously said, the only mistake in life is the lesson not learned. And I really think in Switzerland, people have understood that. And there's a lot going on now to analyze and to learn and to improve uh, in order to be better prepared for the next crisis. So I'm an optimist in that sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Patrick, I'll give you the first word on the closing, but I've, I'm supposed to go to a poll right now. So I would like everybody to open their phones and we're gonna get your input now. If you can take your phone, open a tab on your browser and enter the JESDA code into the Slido. It's, you're not seeing it, slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And then you should get to a window and you'll be able to... Um, the, the slide disappeared, but you'll be able you'll be able to put in the code Jesda twenty one after the hashtag, and then click on the arrow, and then we're going to ask you to vote on what do you think is the biggest problem related to the COVID nineteen pandemic so far: dangers of vaccine nationalism, vaccine hesitancies in the anti vax movement, inadequate international coordination and something just moved here. <laughs> I see that got to be the top one already. It's, it's going very fast. Looks like inadequate international coordination is the overarching lead here. Interesting lockdown measures were not noted as a big uh, problem, although that was a big problem for many developing countries that haven't particularly haven't had access to vaccines. Still voting, things are still moving. Yeah, there's some people online voting as well. Oops, a couple more, one more minute, say. Oh, wait, what happened to the results? <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> I don't have them memorized. Can you go back, please, to the slide? <laughs> so we can take a look and uh, reflect. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Okay, so the big winner, not surprisingly, is inadequate international coordination. Second in by vaccine nationalism. My priority would have been food system health and ecosystem risk, but that's my... Thing going back to my days at WHO, Sumia. And um, then we've got lockdown measures, which is a big issue that perhaps hasn't gotten a lot of attention and as much attention uh, this year in developed countries since most developed countries got out of the lockdowns. Um, any comments? What, what I want to do now is do a wraparound of, of uh, sort of final remarks from the panel. So anything that you'd like to say as a final key message, well, can, we've actually got 10 minutes, so we've got a bit more time than, than, uh, yeah, than I thought, uh, that you could, could comment on these, on these factors and what you would take out of this. And I personally would like to ask you again to go back to the, you know, we talked about climate change and we talked about the pandemic, but I still haven't, I often find it hard to get health people to make that linkage. So I'd love it if, if you can link between food systems, climate, you know, what do we actually practically need to do to not only identify risks as they're emerging, but actually prevent them from emerging in the first place? I think that's a big question today as we face all sorts of urbanization, deforestation, these kinds of changes. But that's my personal question. You're free to say whatever you wish, obviously, and will. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, I'm going to be totally biased, but I think GESDA is a perfect <laughs> instrument to try to do this because we have, you know, this holistic view of science and technology and we have the diplomatic or policy makers and we agree, we, you know, we have this pandemic, you know, we've had it, we've 
we've, we've lived it. We're not totally out of it, but, you know, and we can see two things, the glass half full of half empty. I think, you know, we've learned tremendous amount about surveillance, the power of sequencing, of manufacturing and so on. So we have a couple of, it's a puzzle that we have now to put together and we have to anticipate, okay? And, and, and I see this quite exciting. You know, people tend to forget, but it's extraordinary what, you know, we see all the flaws, but what was accomplished at the same time is incredible. You know, who would have thought that in less than a year we would have such a vaccine? So we were lucky, but I think it shows that it can be done. Technology can resolve part, but certainly not all the problem, okay? And, and uh, this is the place, and that's why it's not, it's science is a must, but it's not sufficient by itself, and we need to bring the policy people. And just science is not the focus science, but it has to be looked on the broadest sense, you know, from AI to global warming and so on, and then be able to focus. So to some extent, it's a case model that we have for us at Jesda, because this has been, you know, people, you don't have to, they understand, they've lived it through. And I think now we have to push the anticipation, okay? And what can we do so that when the next one, you know, hits, we will be prepared, but also to avoid, you know, the next one coming or to try to mitigate the probability that that next one arrives. And I think this is going to be only achieved if you have the kind of science background and what we call the diplomatic or the policy makers. And I think that's really why JESTA was done. So I think it is something that we have to embrace. And for the next year, hopefully we'll convince the Swiss government to go on. <laughs> and I think with for 10 years, because this is a test model. And possibly making health But I'm a bit more, totally biased there. <laughs> but also possibly making health more of a central feature of that model. Because I know when I talked to Olivier months ago, it hasn't been the main focus so far. So perhaps with all the will and interest here, there will be a bigger focus on health as we go forward. Uh, who wants to go next? I'm just Yeah, asking that question. Uh, sure. So I, I do a lot of camping. So when you try to uh, <laughs> set up a tent in a high wind, you have the trapping tent problem. You know you have to pack all the sides of the tent down, but you know they're all flying over the place. And uh, so I, my point is, uh, we need to uh, find one or two places to peg the tent down so it won't fly away. And some things, some pegs are going to take a longer time to fix. So to the question, yes, we've heard this all before. After every pandemic, uh, more or less the same things I've said. That is true. But I think what will be different, should be different this time, is we decide which pegs can we have the best chance of securing now, learning what we've learned. And I think the science acceleration, the way in which we can develop solutions will be a strong peg. We know that there are other things which are flapping around. It doesn't mean that it's not worth doing this just because the other parts are flapping around. And if you can then peg it down, then you can go to the next part, which is then how do you build a, a coalition of, of willing parties that will then take this forward and peg the next one down. And I think eventually, hopefully you'll have most of the 10 not flapping around as much. And uh, then, then I think we'll have a stable base on which to, to proceed. So I, I think then the question will be where, which pegs, which areas could just uh, best play and uh, help to create the foundations for a more holistic and comprehensive solution. Thanks. On the pandemic itself, we have to realize and again, go back to the last 20 years, all of the drivers of this pandemic are key drivers of the 21st century, which are not gonna go away. Um, climate change, ecological change, animal human interfaces, urbanization, trade and travel, they're not, none of those are gonna necessarily change dramatically and they will be with us throughout the century. And, and secondly, that those issues are all gonna be transnational. Um, you won't be able to solve these at, a, at an individual nation state. And, and the, to me, that goes also to the great challenges. Um, and I speak here as a, from a foundation itself, we have really struggled with a transition. You pick up climate and health, which is one of our four challenges now, only four things are welcome. Um, we have really struggled as a reductionist scientist organization to think in a complex systems approach. We've really struggled with that transition in the interface between climate and health. And I don't quite know how to bridge that as an organization, which I think is a real struggle. And the last thing I'll say, people's memories of events like this are very short. There's only a window of opportunity now to make change because within a day, a year, a month, whatever it is, people's attention will change. If you want to make reform, you've got it as a window of opportunity and it will close quite quickly.
Mathis. Just to add to this, um, I am, as I said before, optimistic that this opportunity, Jeremy, that you mentioned, will be um, taken by the Swiss uh, decision makers, and we will be in a much better situation next time. We will address these challenges, and many people will come in, including Jesta, to help uh, create a situation where science and politics talk to each other, understand each other better, and are better you know, uh, positioned to uh, deal with the next crisis. Sumia, 30 seconds, because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to end on time. I'm just, <laughs> we're in Geneva, yeah. we're in Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that uh, the lessons learned this time, I think you know, it's impacted everyone so much that there will be uh, things that will change. And I think we need to start with small steps. We need to start with doing a few practical things. I hope that you know some of the things that we've learned, mRNA technologies and, and, and the genome sequencing, the power of all of that can be used to tackle some of our other big public health problems like tuberculosis and malaria, which you know continue to kill millions every year, but people are talking much less about that. So I think harnessing some of those lessons, the way we've done clinical trials, the way that there's been a mission approach to solving a problem, getting a vaccine done in, in under a year, that we can apply that to other uh, health uh, challenges. And you know, even if we're able to make some advances in some fields, I think it will be, it will be good. And, and then finally, of course, I think the, the number one rated international cooperation and working with organizations like WHO, which is the only place where you, every country, big or small, has an equal voice and, and can come together to find solutions. I think that's even more important than before. So one word of wrap up, we've heard about how tabletop uh, vaccine manufacturer could perhaps break through some of the impasses we're seeing today in vaccine inequality. We've heard about data and surveillance. We've heard about the struggle to bring scientists together with politicians. Um, and we've heard about the struggle to actually link climate change to the health field or the bigger picture of health and the, in its bigger context that is triggering these pandemics. So this is, uh, I think, what the, some of the lessons were left with and perhaps the question of whether JESDA will play a role as in, based in Switzerland as a neutral, the, the traditional neutral country of the world that uh, can be a, a pulse for uh, these signs. I'm getting a sign one minute. I'm, this is the ending. <laughs> so uh, don't worry. This, this, this is the, the place where some perhaps neutral conversations can happen, perhaps between those scientific and diplomatic communities in, in other chambers that are not as charged geopolitically, and um, perhaps Jessica can play a role in stimulating that. So thank you very much.